As we see in the book of Acts, and we still see in the world today, while leaders like Felix may take their problems and sweep them under the rug, God finds people where they are, and he reaches out to them. And no place is too far from God's love, not even prison. If you have your Bibles, open them up to chapter 25 of Acts. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 22, where we're going to see that God was not done with Paul. Even if the Romans or the Jews wanted to be done with Paul, God still had work for him to do and people for him to share the good news of Jesus Christ with. We're in Acts chapter 25. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 22 this morning. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented their charges against Paul. They requested Festus, as a favor to them, to have, to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were, prepare, they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held in Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight to ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day, he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I've done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before, uh, before me there on these charges? Paul answered, Am I not standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried? I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, and I and you yourself know very well. If I, however, am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I, know, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with the council, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they, are spending, since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there's a man whom Felix left as my, pr my prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it is not Roman custom to hand anyone over anyone before they have faced their accusers and had the opportunity to, def to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case. They convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus whom Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss at how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. Let's pray and we'll look at these verses together this morning. Heavenly Father, as we consider this second trial that Paul stands before this uh, second Roman governor, Lord, I, I pray that you would give us wisdom and guidance, not just to understand the facts of what happens, which is useful in and of itself, but to understand why these things still matter to us today. Guide us through your Holy Spirit as we consider your word together. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's start by taking a look at the events that happen here in Paul's second trial uh, in, in the book of Acts. Uh, first of all, after two years, uh, we see that the Jews have not forgotten about Paul. Now, it, this is kind of interesting because in some ways, did the Jews get what they wanted? Pretty much. Paul has been in jail now for two years. If Paul's in jail, what's he not doing? Yeah, he's not telling people about Jesus. So the Jews kind of basically got their way uh, through Felix. They got, they got Paul off the streets, out of the temple. He wasn't talking about Jesus anymore to the people. But was that enough for the Jews? No, what did they want to do? 
Yeah, they wanted to be done with Paul altogether. And we find, we find out that, uh, that they have a plan that's still in place. I doubt it's the same people that decided to take an oath not to eat or drink because two years have now gone by, so I'm pretty sure those guys would all have starved to death at this point. Uh, perhaps they took a little bit of uh, refreshment before they uh, decided, hey, yeah, let's get back to killing Paul. But we find out in, uh, we find out in verse uh, 3 that they already have a plan together that if they can get, if they can get Festus to move, uh, to move Paul back to Jerusalem, what are they going to do? They're going to ambush him and kill him on the way. Now, what we see is Festus, unlike Felix, who wanted to just get rid of the problem, Festus tries to actually deal with this issue right away. This is literally one of the first things he does when he takes over for Felix as the Roman governor to Palestine. He brings, uh, he meets with the Jewish leaders. Uh, they bring a whole bunch of charges, and it kind of sounds like the exact same charges that they had brought against Paul from two years earlier. And what we see, according to verse 7, is they bring the same charges and they have the same lack of proof that they had under Felix. Festus, being a pretty good governor, again, just like Felix, sees through this, uh, these charges. He's like, listen, there's nothing here, according to Roman law, that this man should be in prison for. Certainly not, nothing that's worthy of death. Once again, he gives Paul an opportunity to, to defend himself. And once again, Paul easily defends himself against the Jewish accusations. So Festus comes up with a compromise. He says to Paul, he says, listen, the Jews want to want to try you in Jerusalem. If I give you an escort to Jerusalem, are you willing to go there? And what's Paul's reply? No. He says, no, I'm at the Jewish court. I'm at the right place uh, in front of the right person. I'm not going to Jerusalem to have a trial before you there, what does Paul know? The same thing he knew two years ago, right? He knew two years ago they were going to try and kill him, and he's pretty sure that if, they, if he leaves uh, the safety of the, of the Roman palace, what's going to happen? He's going to get killed. So he says, here's what I want to do. If you're not going to try my case, I want to stand trial as a Roman citizen before Caesar. So he says, I, I declare... I want a trial before Caesar. And Festus, who, again, is brand new on the scene, it's a hard thing to deny a Roman citizen an audience with, uh, with the Caesar if he has a real reason. And Festus knows full well that this guy has been wrongfully accused. The last couple of verses, we, uh, we get a conversation between Festus and King Agrippa. King Agrippa is actually going to put Paul on trial the very next day, uh, and we'll look at that next week, but that doesn't come into play. Now that we know what happened, the question is, what does any of this mean to us? This is, this is interesting. It's, in many ways, this is a repeat of the trial that we saw two years ago in Paul's life and last week for us. But I will say there are some important themes from tri Paul's trial before Festus that I, I, I think we should look at today. And the reality is, while you may never be wrongfully accused, but the truth is some of us probably have been wrongfully accused in life, you may never be passed around the highest courts of the land, there are some important themes that come out in these verses that can help us in the trials that we face in life. Again, maybe you've stood before, a tr maybe you've been on trial, or sometimes we face just trials in life. And I think there's some important things in these passages that will help us in these areas. The first, thing that, the first theme that we see in these verses is this, that integrity matters. Throughout these trials, one thing that has never been a question was the honesty and integrity of Paul. He has been tried by two separate Roman governors, and there is no point at, in any of these trials do either one of them doubt Paul's character. They don't. The, remember, these men aren't Christians. These men aren't Jewish. These men are pagan. They are pagan politicians. But they meet Paul and they immediately trust and believe him. Why? Because Paul was very honest and his integrity shone through. And this is what the Bible would hope for any follower of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 10.9 says this, 
Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. You know why Paul doesn't get found out? He doesn't have anything to hide. In every one of these trials, Paul is literally just telling them what he's doing with his time. And you know what? Paul doesn't have any reason to lie. He just comes out and shares exactly. It's the Jews who are being deceptive. Why? Because they know they're lying to these Roman governors. They know they're lying in wait trying to kill this guy. They're the ones that have to twist the truth. They're the ones that are trumping up what exactly Paul does. Paul just gets in there and says, this is what I did here. This is what I did here. This is what I did here. This is what Roman law says, and I obeyed it. This is what Jewish law says. I know that very well. I obeyed that. This is what God's law says. I know that, and I have obeyed it. The beauty of what we see here is that multiple professional judges have looked closely at the life of Paul and repeatedly have found no evil in him. Ultimately, this allowed Paul to continue to be a minister for Jesus Christ even when he was in jail. Even when Paul was in prison for two years, what does, what does Felix do? He keeps bringing him out to hear from him. Why? Because deep down in his heart, he knew Paul was honest. He knew that Paul would tell him the truth. Peter says this too. Peter, who was familiar as well with being in prison, says this in 1 Peter chapter 3.16. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Listen, we can't control what people say about us. We can't control what people think about us. We can get upset, but guess what? People are going to think and they're going to say what they want about you. They may believe generalities about Christianity. They may believe falsities about you. But the reality is when they meet you and when they talk to you, are you a person of integrity like the Messiah that you serve? As followers of Christ, we are called to be different in the way that we live. And one of the most powerful ways that we can do this is by being people who keep our word. Who, as Jesus put it, our yes means yes, and our no means no. Recently, uh, there was a large number of Americans that were asked what they would be willing to do for $10 million. Two-thirds of the Americans polled agreed to at least one, and sometimes several of the following things that they would be willing to do for $10 million. 25% of those who were polled said that they would abandon their entire family. 25% said that they would leave their church and never return. 23% said they would become a prostitute for a week or more. 16% said they'd give up their American citizenship. 16% said that they would leave their spouse. 10% said they would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. 7% said that they would be willing to kill a stranger. 3% said that they would put their kids up for adoption. We live in a culture that does not honor its word, that would be willing to sell the things that they hold most dear for money that is here today and tomorrow disappears. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're called to live differently than that. We're called to live as people of integrity, people who keep our words, our vows, and our promises. 2 Corinthians 8.21 says this, For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. We don't just do right because God asks us to. We also do right because when people see the lives that we live and see the difference in the way that we live, when we choose honest gain instead of deceitful gain, when we choose to fulfill our vows and our promises, We give a powerful testimony of a God who always does those things. 
who always keeps his promise, who always shows up for us. Be people of integrity. During his time as a rancher, Teddy Roosevelt and one of his cowhands lassoed a maverick steer. They lit a fire and prepared the branding irons. The part of the range that they were on was claimed by Gregor Lang, one of Roosevelt's neighbors. And according to the cattleman's rule, the steer therefore belonged to Lang since they had stopped it on his land. As his cowboy applied the brand, Roosevelt asked him, wait, shouldn't you be putting on Lang's brand? He said, that's all right, boss. I'm putting on your brand. But you're putting on the wrong brand. It's like, that's right, sir. Roosevelt looked at his cow hand. He said, I want you to drop that iron. I want you to go back to the ranch, pack your stuff, and leave. I don't need you to work for me anymore. Any man who is willing to steal for me will gladly steal from me. See, Teddy Roosevelt understood the same thing that God commands. When God wants people whose word can be trusted, whose honor can be trusted, who is filled with honesty and integrity. Paul was one of those people, which is why even in jail, even in a place where we think is full of thieves and robbers and liars, Paul was seen as a person that could be trusted. That is a rare thing indeed and made him different from the world around him. Well, the next theme we see in the second trial of Paul is we get some real insight into our relationship with the government. This has become a tricky subject for Americans over the last few years, hasn't it? Our role with our government has been something that's come under a lot of fire, not just in our country, but literally in our churches. There has been much debate about what is the church's role in government. How do we respond to those, even when they do not believe the same things that we believe? And while this seems to be a tricky subject, let me be honest, it shouldn't be. It's really not that tricky. Because the Bible gives both practical examples, like we're seeing here in Paul, in the life of Paul, and biblical instruction regarding a, a follower of Christ's relationship with the government. We have been watching Paul literally throughout his missionary journeys, and especially now under these, under these Roman trials, how he navigates working among a pagan government. And let's be honest, we live under a pagan government. It is not, we may have God we trust on our currency, but we do not trust God as a government. He is not the final authority in how laws are passed. So much like Paul, we are living under a pagan government. How did Paul navigate that? What did he teach? We both see it in his actions and hear it in his words. Look what he writes in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear a sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Let me be honest. The Bible is incredibly straightforward in this area. And this isn't the only place where it talks about it. Peter says very similar words in one of his epistles as well. We are called to be subject to the authority that is before us. You may be saying to yourself, well, Pastor George, they're not believers in Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? Neither were Felix. Neither, neither was Festus. Neither was the Caesar in which Paul appeals to. 
Do you know who he's appealing to here? The emperor of Rome, at the time that Paul appeals to him, is Emperor Nero, who would eventually put Paul to death and execute thousands of Christians. Paul knew full well that the person he was appealing to was not a godly man. So why does he appeal to him? Because he understood what Romans 8.28 tells us. That the leadership that is in place, even if they are not godly, are there to do God's good will. Romans 8.28 says God works for the good of all those according to his purpose. It doesn't mean that everything that happens in our life is good. It means that everything that is happening in our lives, even the terrible things, are for our good. So can we have a godless king or a godless governor or a godless president who is doing good on behalf of God? We can. Can God's will be being done by a pagan? Absolutely. Did Pharaoh do God's will? Absolutely. Did Nebuchadnezzar do God's will? Absolutely. Did King Darius do God's will? Absolutely. Is is Emperor Nero going to do God's will? Yup. The reality is, the Bible it tells us exactly what our attitude towards government should be. And listen, I understand that it can be very difficult to submit to people that we know are wrong, that we know do not know or love God, who misunderstand the teachings of the Bible and are leading our, our, our nation in a direction that we believe is not godly. Can that be difficult to stomach? Absolutely. So is there something we can do as we submit to that authority? Well, guess what? The Bible tells us there is. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says this, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. You want to change the hearts of kings and governors, presidents, congressmen? You know what the Bible says? Pray. Petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving. What does it say? What is our most powerful weapon to change our culture? It's prayer. It's prayer. Want to change the hearts of our government, of our leaders? The Bible says pray for them. Lift them up by name. Leadership is a hard job. It is an exhausting job. It is a thankless job. The Bible says you can do something to strengthen your leaders. Even leaders who do not see the world the way you do. Even leaders who do the exact same thing that you would do if you were in their place. You can pray for them. The prayers of the righteous have a lot of power. But they have no power if we do not pray. Pray for our leaders. Pray for those who God has put there, because they are doing His will, sometimes whether they like it or not. The final, the final theme that we see from these verses is that we need to keep trusting in God. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, by a show of hands, have ever grown impatient waiting for God to do something you believed He said He was going to do? Anybody ever been impatient with God? A couple of you. Imagine how Paul, can, can we empathize with Paul for a second? Think about how he must have felt. Two years of his life. I, I get the idea that Paul was a pretty driven guy, right? We've, we've been hanging out with Paul for a lot of Sundays now, right? Paul's a pretty driven guy, right? He's going from city to city, place to place, preaching, teaching, getting beat up, he, Gets back up, goes right back into the town. I get the idea Paul's got a little something to him, right? Here's Paul. He spends two years in a Roman prison knowing full well that the people that are holding him in the prison 
know that he's done nothing wrong. Like, Felix literally said it to him last chapter. He brings him in, he listens to him. He's like, yeah, I, I know you haven't done anything deserving of this. I'm just going to keep you here, put you on ice. <laughs> Amazingly, there is not one place in the book of Acts or anywhere within the letters of Paul where Paul complains about God forgetting him. I'll be honest. Sometimes, sometimes I, I can complain multiple times in a day like, hey God, what's going on here? There's not one place in any, anywhere in the book of Acts or anywhere in any of his letters that Paul gives the slightest indication that he is frustrated with God. I'm sure he's frustrated with the world, but nowhere where he's frustrated with God. Why? Paul trusted in God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. This is a really beautiful verse. Some of you guys, I'm sure, know this by heart. But do we actually live it as followers of Jesus Christ? I started, uh, when, I, when I was looking over this passage, I started uh, to write down all the times this week that I was frustrated or angry when something didn't happen the way I wanted or at the time that I wanted. Um, and I was going to read that list, um, you know, just to keep myself humble. And then uh, when I got to the second page, and it was only Wednesday, uh, <laughs> I realized uh, may maybe that, that would not be the best use of my sermon time. The point is, we can talk about trusting God. We can talk about not leaning on our understanding or wanting the world to function in the way that we want it to function. We can say those things, but do we actually live like that? We get angry about traffic, having to wait in lines, being put on hold, interruptions, delays, other people's mistakes that we have to clean up. We spend a lot of time really frustrated, really angry about a lot of things. Are we people who actually trust God or do we just trust God when things are going the way we want them to go? That's a hard question for us to ask. And sometimes I don't think we really want to know the answer to that. Because I'll be honest, this week I realized I'm really happy with God when things are going really smoothly. And I'm really quick to get frustrated with him when my day gets a little choppy. When I don't get as many things done as I wanted to get done. When there's a few more interruptions than I expected. When I got to wait in a line that I wasn't expecting to wait in. Meanwhile, in my times of anger and frustration, how many opportunities Am I missing opportunities for real discussion, to genuinely slow down, to find a moment to pray? Instead of being angry, did I trust God that he was doing things for my good, not just the things that I wanted? Real faith and real trust happen when we allow God to be in control of our lives, of our schedules. And that's what Paul does here. The two years he spent in jail wasn't two years wasted of his life. Paul says, I'm the servant of God. If God needs me here for two years, so be it. That's where I'll be. And I'll be faithful in what you give me to do in these two years. If God wants me to wait in the line, aren't I his servant? Shouldn't I wait in that line dutifully? God needs me to answer a phone call while I'm in the middle of writing my sermon. 
shouldn't I thankfully pick up that phone and answer it? The same is true with us. If our lives are ours, then yes, we have every right to be frustrated and angry. But the Bible tells us we're not our own. We're bought with a price. That we serve God with our lives. So if that's the case, doesn't God have the right to use us how he sees fit? To put us in the positions he wants us to be in? To set up the times and the attitudes of our day? In fact, in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul tells us exactly the kind of attitude that we should have. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests before God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. He says, listen, don't be stressed in any situation. Why? Because God has you where he wants you to be. God has not forgotten you. He's not made a mistake. Our friend Abner that we saw at the very beginning, the world crumbled him up and threw him in a prison cell and frankly probably didn't really want to see him again. In the world's eyes, they got one more thug off the streets. But God had him exactly where he needed him to be so that that prison guard could slide him a Bible and that he had nothing to do but allow God to work on his heart. We can shake our fist at the world around us. We can be angry at the delays, angry at the frustrations, or we can see them as opportunities for God to do what he wants us to do, not just what we want to do. If we don't trust God in the daily things of life, let me ask you a question. Do you really think that we're going to be able to trust him in the big, life-altering things? If I get angry at God because i got to wait in line at Wawa for my coffee, when the real, powerful, life-changing things, these things that we're just waiting for God to give us, if we can't be faithful in the small things, you really think we're going to be faithful in the big things? No. We are who we are. We can learn to trust God, or we can learn to be impatient with Him. David was a two-year-old with leukemia. He was taken by his mother, Deborah, to, a Mass to the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston to see Dr. John Truman, who specialized in treating children with cancer and various blood diseases. Dr. Truman's prognosis was devastating. David has a 50-50 chance. The countless clinic visits, the blood tests, the intravenous drugs, the fear, the pain, the mother's ordeal can be almost as bad as the child's because she must stand by, unable to bear the pain herself. David never cried in the waiting room. And although his friends in the clinic had to hurt him and stick needles in him, he hustled in ahead of his mother with a smile, sure to welcome whatever he got. When he was three, David had to have a spinal tap, a painful procedure at any age. It was explained to him because he was sick, Dr. Truman had to do something to make him better. If it hurts, remember that Dr. Truman is doing this because he loves you, Deborah said to her son. The procedure was horrendous. It took three nurses to hold David still. He yelled and sobbed and struggled in pain. When it was almost over, the tiny boy, soaked in sweat and tears, looked up at the doctor and he gasped, thank you, Dr. Truman, for my hurting. God is always working things for our good. Even the painful things, even the really genuine, lousy things in life are there for our good because we have a God who loves us and he wants us to trust him. Amazingly, Paul did. Two years in prison, he sat around waiting for freedom that, frankly, he deserved. But he understood, I'm God's servant 
And if this is where God needs me, then this is where I will be. It would be good and blessed if we had that attitude in ourselves. Are we willing to trust God in the life that he has given us? Are we willing to do the things that he's called us to do in the place that he has called us to be? We can always dream about all the things we want to accomplish, or we can do the things that God has actually given us to accomplish right here and right now. But it takes trust. Not Sunday school trust, not trust in God, but genuine belief and faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have every day to trust you. And uh, maybe we haven't done such a great job. And if we, if we haven't, Lord, we can seek your forgiveness and grace. And the Bible tells us that you give it to us freely. And you give us the opportunity each and every day. We're told that your mercies are new. So I pray that whatever situation we find ourselves in, whichever trial we may be going through, whatever struggle is in front of us, Lord, first of all, we would know that you love us and that you walk with us through those things. Second of all, I pray that we would understand who we are. We are your servants, here to honor you with our lives, with the truthfulness and integrity of our lives, in the way that we deal with the issues in our world, even, even the government that we live under and that we would put our faith and trust in you, to have real, genuine faith that you are working for the good in our lives. But we thank you, not just for the good you do for us, Lord, but we thank you for the difficulty. We praise you in the storms of life, because it is in those storms that we have no doubt that you are with us, that you are exactly who you say you are. We thank you for these things. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray.